All right. Well, thank you guys for, for joining us today. Uh, this webinar is actually, it's brand new and it's near and dear to my heart, but we're going to talk about four productivity hacks from law firm owners, essentially how to expand not only your capacity, but increase the revenue uh, of your firm without taking up more of your own time. Because uh, this is a topic that I think as, as any business grows, you know, one of the biggest barriers and limitations sometimes becomes the capacity of your own firm or, or your own capacity to kind of expand it and take it to that next level. So we'll be kind of talking about a few things that you can do to, that can help expand not just your own capacity, but the capacity of your firm as well to uh, ultimately grow and increase revenue in the process. So my name is Michael Mogul. I'm president and CEO of a company called Crisp Video. And we work with attorneys all over the country. Essentially, we help them not only come up with their content strategy, but we even produce their content, produce their videos. Uh, we implement them and market them. And over the past several years, so it's kind of an interesting um, fact about us, is that we have doubled every single year for the last, really, we're in our sixth year, so every single year. And not only have we doubled in terms of um, our revenue, but also the number of clients and the size of our team. So when we talk about a topic like this, as far as expanding capacity, this is something that um, not only I do I see that many of our clients have gone through, but I have, have go gone through and I'm going through firsthand. So um, when we look at you know growing over 200% every single year and you know over 600% across the last three, I can I can assure you that that has definitely come with uh, a lot of unique growth challenges. And if we did not uh, essentially uh, approach those in the right way, then we wouldn't have been able to grow at that rate. And and many times that I see business owners that aren't able to take their business to that next level, whether it's you know a seven figure mark or or what have you, just because of um, of their own capacity. So we'll talk about a lot of the things that have been very helpful to me. I mean, I think that. This webinar, oftentimes we talk about marketing and different marketing strategies and content strategies. Um, this one in particular, I think, is really unique in the sense that it really talks about how you spend your time, ways to be more efficient, and ultimately, I, I think at the end of the day, you can have two like-minded business owners, but um, one spends their time in a different way versus another, and that ultimately determines uh, not only how quickly their business grows, but ultimately to the level at which their business grows. And then for those of you that hang around to the end of this webinar, uh, we have a, a, a little guide that we put together for you, so it'll have a lot of the takeaways from this webinar that you'll be able to apply, and it's a, it's a workbook that you'll be able to work through, but it's the Lawyer's Seven-Step Guide to Maximum Productivity. And as we go through a lot of this stuff, it'll, it'll probably make much more sense, um, but I'll have this for you as soon as we get um, to the very end of the uh, of the webinar. So here's a couple of the things that we'll cover today. Um, one is just the simplest way to achieve critical results in your law firm, just getting things done, and also why the tasks that you assign oftentimes aren't getting done and how you can fix it. Uh, in addition to that, we'll talk about identifying areas where you can streamline across your practice, as well as strategies to systemize and automate manual tasks. And then the one thing you can do every day to make yourself more productive. Now, uh, undoubtedly, I'm sure some of the things that we'll talk about, uh, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with. But if there's even one thing that you pick, pick off from this webinar, I think it can make a dramatic impact in your business. And this, again, I'm, I'm telling you, I think is the biggest difference between um, like various businesses and then not just the growth rate that they achieve, but ultimately the scale at which they grow. So uh, before we get into that, I do want to touch on this just because, you know, what is kind of the the reason why we're talking about yielding maximum capacity. And Law Tigers had put out the study, they had uh, uh, they'd asked you know, thousands of attorneys and they asked them, well, what's keeping them up at night? Uh, a large majority were saying that they spend too much time working, they don't get enough free time, uh, their firm is fluctuating in month to month fee revenue, or their marketing doesn't generate enough new business and new leads, or the firm's not generating fees at the rate that they desire. And then, of course, the the common, I think, fears of any business owner is that the fear that uh, any time in the future, the cases will stop coming in, the show will be over, um, and so on. So this is obviously on on the mind of many, many law firm owners and many firms. Um, it's, again, it's very, very stressful. And, and growing a business isn't easy. So as we talk about this, I think this is a topic that's near and dear to, to really most business owners. And they're simply looking for ways in which they can get more done in the time that they have, which is... We all have the same 24 hours, ultimately, right? So uh, I do want to say that uh, we'll uh, we'll likely share a copy of these slides. Just email us, um, and we'll have that for you. So as we move quickly, because I know we've got a lot of different things to cover, if um, if you end up missing something, just shoot us an email. We're happy to send you a copy as well. And then of course we'll have that workbook at the end of the webinar as well. So 
to evaluate your firm's capacity, uh, just think about a few of these questions, right? Um, and think about how many of them that you can actually answer yes to, right? Is your phone ringing off the hook with cases you want to accept but can't because you don't have the bandwidth? Is your team overworked with your existing caseload? Uh, is your staff spread thinly across multiple roles uh, to so much to the point where they can't focus on any one initiative? And are cases taking longer to resolve than you'd like for them to? And ultimately, do you think you'd be able to take on more profitable cases if you implemented more efficient management strategies? So this speaks to the firm's capacity. Now, what about these questions, right? Do you spend so much time working in your business, so being in the details that you can't really work on the on the business, so more um, higher level like business strategy? Um, also, do you find yourself spending a lot of time on tasks that you just really hate doing that just suck you know the energy out of you essentially? Um, and is there somebody else in your office who could complete this task that you hate? So uh, we often find that what one person, you know, I guess one man's trash is another man's treasure. Um, and there are people that really uh, out there, I'm telling you, whether they're in your office or you haven't hired them yet, for example, that there are people that love to do the things that you hate to do, right? And I'm sure that there are things that you love to do that somebody else, you know, it, it may not be their strength. Um, so think about some of these questions um, and I, and ask yourself, I mean, can you answer yes to any of them? And if, and if yes, I mean, to really either slide, um, you have opportunities to not only expand your law firm's capacity, but also your personal capacity. Um, and by doing so, you will increase revenue. I mean, you're just essentially able to expand what you're already doing. And this isn't so much of a webinar for like, how do I get the phone to ring? This is more so from the standpoint um, of what happens when you've kind of reached the limit, you know, limitations of what you yourself are able to do or what your, your, your current team is able to do. And how do you like take that to the next level? And how do you continue to grow and expand? Because there's only so much any one individual can do. And as you're getting more and more information and you're getting more and more business, how do you continue to manage that in a way that allows you to do so effectively and without really driving yourself crazy? So this brings us to a concept called capacity utilization. And this is really the economics of productivity. And it's the relationship between productivity and capacity because um, there's, you know, it's not always linear, meaning that um, sometimes you have a lot of things on your plate, but it doesn't mean that you're approaching them as efficiently and effectively as you could be. It doesn't always mean that you need to hire more people. Um, sometimes it means that you can simply take on um, more, you know, essentially more initiatives, more clients, more cases uh, by simply changing the way in which you operate, your team operates through systems and processes, which we'll talk about, um, and even from uh, how you manage your time and what you focus on. And my, my good friend Ben Glass, um, he has this quote, I think it was actually in uh, one of his recent books, and he says that, yep, you know, damn right we're running a business first. Without a business, there is no profession to do. So um, this is one that I'm sure will probably uh, offend a, a percentage of people in, in talking about the practice of law. Is it a business or is it a profession? But Ben is absolutely right. And, and I, I'll, I'll speak from experience in that we work with hundreds of law firms that if you're not running a, I guess, a profitable business, if it's something where uh, if you're not able to take care of your team, take care of really yourself and your family, then you're not really providing, you know, in many cases we find that if you're exhausted and you're not taking care of anybody, then the, the quality of the legal representation that you offer is probably not what, you know, not only not what you're necessarily capable of, but also um, it's probably falling short and the experience that you're offering clients probably isn't a very good one. And then in addition to this, uh, it really doesn't matter how good you are at practicing law if you're invisible to your community, if they don't know that you exist, if you can't, you know, if, if they ultimately don't know how they can um, how they can hire you, where they can find you, how they can reach out, because um, there's a lot of just phenomenal, phenomenal attorneys out there that are truly, I think, would uh, would be in, in their client's best interest. But unfortunately, they get overshadowed by the fact that there's a lot of great marketers and a lot of really great business owners out there that are doing a good job of capturing their attention first. So again, the reality is uh, at this point, I think just given the nature of how competitive things are within the legal profession and how saturated the, mar uh, the markets are, you have uh, at, at this point a duty and an obligation to position yourself in the way in which consumers out there can find you and hire you. Um, and also, in addition, uh, when you think about some of the models for running a successful business, and, and this this can go against uh, I think some of the things that are are taught in school and that you know you're you're providing this amazing public service for the good of the people. 
but you can't pour from an empty cup, you know? And, and the reality is that um, if you are struggling, if you're struggling financially, if you're exhausted, if you're running on empty, if your team is running on empty, that all then kind of impacts the way in which clients are treated, the, the way in which clients experiences, the quality of the, of the representation that you provide. Um, so it's really important that you put on your own oxygen mask first before you can really help others. Again, it's, um, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to pour from an empty cup. And we find that you know, in, in, when you've got a successful business that is working for you and you've got a team that's aligned and you've got a phenomenal culture, not only is it much more enjoyable to come in every single day, but also the impact that you're making in your community is much greater. Uh, it's a much more happy, positive environment. And as a result, it's a very like fast growing environment. So if I look across the hundreds of law firms that we work, out, uh, that we work with, the ones that are growing the quickest are also the ones that really do have things dialed in in terms of like how they run their business, how they like, you know, their, their company culture, their systems, their processes and all those things. And they're able to be better attorneys as a result. So the other reason is, um, you know, and as I've mentioned, is that when you run your law firm like a successful business, you will inevitably be able to provide more value to your clients and potential clients. So, for example, part of running a good business is offering an amazing client experience and amazing customer service, um, being responsive, being prompt, all those things. Um, not only are they, you know, again, good things to have, but they're also business decisions. So, for example, if you could offer terrible uh, customer service and client experience and still have a thriving, successful business, um, well, you know, then, then I'm sure that you could do that, but the market always decides, and the market has decided that they um, they really value attorneys and law firms that are prompt, that are responsive, that, um, that you know, when you, when you call their firm, they answer the phone promptly. It's someone who they're happy to speak with, that is informed. So all those things and getting those details right is very important. Um, and that's what the market is really asking for. And, and, and again, the world needs more good attorneys. So uh, if you want to be out there helping more people and, and making a greater impact in your community, uh, the, the more that you're able to grow and scale your business, the more that you're able to impact your community. So um, at the end of the day, it's important to take care of things internally first, and that way you can make a much greater external impact. So the reality is this, though, um, and here is the challenge that we commonly see. Uh, most attorneys went to school um, to learn how to lawyer and how to excel in the practice of law, but they don't really train uh, the, the business of law or how to acquire cases or how to market or how to position yourself. So if you want to grow your law firm and truly expand your capacity and make a greater impact, you're going to have to be able to run it like a business and grow and scale it. And, and I'll talk about uh, four, I guess, productivity hacks that have been really uh, impactful, not just on me, but uh, hundreds of our clients as well. And uh, if again, if you even take away one of them, um, I'm confident that they will be a game changer in your practice. And I'm not saying that as hyperbole. I truly believe that these things are, I think, I think largely the reason why we have grown 200% every single year for the last five years. So the first one is prioritization, right? So I'm sure we all uh, are familiar with prioritization to a degree, but uh, it's important to consider something that's called the Pareto Principle. So in 1906, uh, Italian economist Wilfredo Pareto, he noticed a pattern of uneven distribution in his life. And he found that about 20% of the plants in his garden produced 80% of the healthy crops. And he began to actually extrapolate this pattern and found that it actually uh, was uh, applied to many other areas of his life. So for example, he found that like the 20% of the population in Italy owned 80% of land and 20% of the companies in Italy accounted for 80% of the production. So the general idea, the Pareto principle is that 20% of your time produces 80% of your results. And this is I mean, this could not be more true. I mean, you'll see it pretty much across anything, right? So like, for example, 20% of your marketing probably produces 80% of the impact. 20% um, of your clients probably are um, the ones that generate like 80% of the revenue. And if you can identify which 20% achieves the best results, you can maximize your effort and productivity. It's also a way of saying that most things really don't matter. And if you spend your time simply being busy, it doesn't mean that you're making an impact and you're being productive. So. The importance of prioritization here is that it allows you to really identify and execute only the most important initiatives or critical results. I mean, some things simply will not get done, and that's okay if you're focusing on the right things, and those are the ones that will move you forward. I mean, I'm sure we all have to-do lists, and you know, the, the likelihood of checking off every single item on our list every single day um, is extremely low, and I'm sure it can uh, result in frustration every day when you have items on your list that don't get done, or you know, items on your like marketing rocks that simply don't get done, for example. But if you're, if you're prioritizing effectively and you get the top 20% done every single time, 
that is going to have the greatest impact. So um, something to think about. And in terms of like how we spend our time, you know, consider you know, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. I mean, Elon Musk is over Tesla, SpaceX, and the Boring Company. Um, Jeff Bezos has got Amazon, Whole Foods, The Washington Post, and several other businesses. These guys have the same 24 hours in a day as as all of us do, right? And and again, it really comes down to how are you spending those hours, and not so much just how many hours are you working, right? It's are you focusing on the right things? And as I mentioned, really at the start of this webinar, you could have two separate law firm owners, um, both working the same number of hours, and yet they achieve completely different results and outcomes. And one's business grows and scales immensely, and the other one's really kind of stuck in place. Um, so it's not necessarily a function of always how many hours you spend, but really if you're prioritizing the way in which you spend those hours, and not just the way you spend those hours, but also members of your team. So the way to prioritize is to begin with what's called an activity audit. And this will be a part of the, uh, the blueprint that we'll have for you at the end of this webinar. But essentially you have to be able to identify areas in which you can buy back your own time so i'm sure that there's few of us that really have a ton of free time meaning that like you're just looking for things that can occupy your time i mean that that tends to rarely be the case so you have to find areas in which you can buy back time um, and you can identify these areas by auditing the way in which you spend your time so you know it's important to um, to put together this kind of audit and uh, i'll have a guide for you in a moment that kind of explains how to do it so you can identify what types of activities you're focusing on, like which ones align with your strengths, which types of activities that you do on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis that may cause you stress and frustration, which ones can be delegated, and which ones make you money. So the way to actually do this exercise is, you know, step one, you know, list out all the things that you do when you're working in your business on a weekly basis. So it could be things like going to trial, meeting with clients, meetings, answering emails, you know, all those different things. And then in step two, identify how much time you spend on each of these initiatives every single week so you can you can roughly estimate um but this will help you outline and give you an idea as to where your time is going and, and this again this exercise may surprise you um, once you've done that you know the next step is to kind of calculate your hourly rate so either you bill by the hour or you can figure this out by dividing your annual salary by the number of hours you typically work in a week multiplied by the number of weeks that you work in a year and this will give you an estimate as to your hourly rate so like what your time is is ultimately worth. Now, again, uh, I'm moving quickly through this stuff, so don't worry. We have this all in the in the guide that we'll provide in this webinar, and then also, if you'd like to get a copy of the slides, um, I'll provide my email address as well at the end of the webinar, so we'll send it to you. So once you've identified these first three things, um, the next thing you want to do is to really circle and and identify the activities that don't allow you to focus on the critical results in your law firm. So they can still be important to do but they may not always um, be the things that make you money or move the needle forward, or most importantly, they may not be the highest and best use of your time, right? It doesn't mean they don't need to get done. It just means that you could be making a bigger impact if your time was spent on other areas and other tasks within your law firm. Um, and then once you've circled those things, you add them up, and, uh, and we'll talk about intentionally how you can get these things off your plate, but you can look at not only how many hours you can buy back, so you can, you know, Get these hours back every single week, which can make a huge impact because you can you can invest those hours in something else. But you can also figure out what those hours are costing you, right? So the time that you spend answering emails, um, the, what is the cost of that, right? Um, and then there's other things that you can audit as well, even outside of the business, uh, your activity outside of the office. Like how much time do you spend on other activities that could allow you, you know, if you were able to get these things off your plate, more time to either work on your business or you know spend that time with friends and family or you know, restorative activities, things that you actually enjoy. So um, how much time do you spend on laundry or dry cleaning, right? Um, cooking, meal prep, cleaning your home, grocery shopping, like these are all things that when you when you actually, unless you happen to enjoy them, right, which I'm sure some people do, um, that if you were able to get these things off your plate, you can still fill those hours with something or, you know, candidly, you can fill them with nothing um, because restorative time is important too. But um, it, there, there comes a point where, um, Maybe you shouldn't be the one cleaning your office, right? And um, for the cost of hiring um, someone to actually clean your office, that hour, two hours, or three hours that you get back, you can spend on activities that actually make the firm money. So it's important to really identify what, the, like, how much time is being spent on these things, and being able to actually buy back time that you can invest in not either the business, your family, friends, or just even time to yourself. So the way uh, to really prioritize this is, is a phenomenal book uh, I, that. I actually came across and read it last year, and this was actually one of my favorite books from last year. Um, it's called The One Thing, uh, and it, it is by Gary Keller, and the, the core, you know, 
I guess the core focus of this book, and when it talks about prioritization, that you know, they get to really drilling down to the one thing uh, every single day. So what's the one thing you can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? And this helps to prioritize what is that one thing you should focus on first and foremost, where if it was the only thing that you got done in your day, that that would actually make everything either easier or unnecessary. And by combining your purpose, priority, and productivity, your one thing, this like focusing on this and getting this done first before anything else, will help you get extraordinary results. So you can buy the book on Amazon if you're interested. It's a great book. Um, but the you know the core idea is that you only have so much time and energy, right? And when you spread yourself out, you end up very spread, you know, spread very thinly. So the idea is that you can you can do what's called addition by subtraction. So it's not simply adding more things to your plate, but allowing you to be more focused, efficient, and effective, and not just you, but your team as well, by subtracting things, right? So you can uh, by doing fewer things but more effectively, um, you can make sure that you're able to actually move things forward rather than having you know, the same meeting five or six times to actually get traction, right? Or focusing on an initiative that seems like it's been taking six months or nine months to execute because you're only able to spend fractional time on it. Um, so it's really important to have the, your priorities clearly established and realizing that success is built sequentially, right? It's simply one thing at a time, one thing builds up to the next, and that's how you knock over these huge dominoes. Um, so prioritizing and focusing on your one thing is key here. So the other thing that uh, we do, and this is actually across our team, our entire team does this every single day. Um, we actually lay out our schedules and then uh, we, we do it for the following day. So, um, you know, whether it's our marketing team, our sales team, our operations, and so on, um, you know, rather than identifying just a long list of things to be done, right, because we all have huge to-do lists, uh, we simply outline, well, what are the three critical results that you hope to accomplish? So this doesn't necessarily mean, like, these are the tasks, like, send this email, but what would be considered a critical result, right? So, for example, converting two consultations into clients, identifying three ways to market the firm. Um, these can be critical results that actually move the needle forward. It's not simply, you know, um, like have good meetings, right? Or make phone calls or what have you. Like really think about how can you make it measurable um, so that you can actually achieve a critical result. And again, our team, we do this team wide. So the other thing that's been very helpful uh, to me personally, and I, I use one of these, um, it's called a productivity planner. Um, it's by Intelligent Change. You can you can purchase one of these either on Amazon or uh, their website, intelligentchange.com. Um, this has been one of the greatest productivity tools that I've used. Um, it's a pretty simple concept, but it helps you not only lay out um, your week for the following week, but it also helps you prioritize effectively. And it's something that I carry with me daily. Um, again, you can you can do this yourself in something like Evernote, but um, but I found it extremely beneficial. So essentially what uh, what they do in the productivity planner is what's called the Ivy Lee method. So at the end of each workday, you kind of write down the six most important things you need to accomplish for the following day. Um, so you don't write down more than six tasks because I'm sure we could all write you know, 20 if, if we had to. Um, and then you prioritize those six in their order of true importance. Like, so when you're defining true importance, I look at it from the standpoint of like, what has to be has to be done that day before you can actually shut your eyes at night that you would consider it a good day and a productive day. So meaning that there will be things that you don't get done, but what are the crucial essential things? Um, and then when you arrive the next day, you concentrate only on the first task because it's the most important. And this is something where I typically um, knock out my number one item uh, first thing in the morning, usually between like seven and 9 a.m., really even before some of the team gets in. Um, and you work on that first task until it's finished before moving on to the second. I mean, again, that's that's priority. There's, you know, multitasking is a myth. Uh, we'll probably get into that in maybe a separate webinar. But um, you literally do not touch anything else, don't respond to any emails, don't take any phone calls until you get your first and most important item of the day done. And then you can actually start the day feeling probably very productive as a result. Uh, and then you approach the rest of your list in the same fashion. So um, then you focus on the second item and you don't touch items three through six until that is complete. And at the end of the day, you move any unfinished, unfinished items to a new list of six tasks and repeat this process every working day. So I essentially fill this out at the end of each work day for the following day. And with the productivity planner, you actually can also kind of map out the week. And uh, and this will give you really good insight in terms of like how you're investing your time. And, and ultimately, you can even look back and see um, kind of the lessons learned and ways in which you can be more effective and more productive. Now, there's other things that you can do in terms of auditing your time and the, the time in which, you know, how your team spends their time. There's a couple of apps. One's called Rescue Time. The other one's called Time Doctor that run in the background of, you know, on your computer. 
And this will help calculate you know, how much time you're spending in email, how much time you're spending browsing the web, how much time you're spending on Facebook, um, in, you know, in various, like let's say, case management software and so on. And this is really, really helpful to do because there's, you know, there's always a difference, I think, between how we believe we spend our time and then how we actually spend our time. So you may think that you, know, you may only be on Facebook a couple hours a week, but then you pull it up in, uh, in Time Doctor Rescue Time and it shows that you're spending 25 or 30 hours a week on Facebook. So these are amazing opportunities to just kind of not only gain like, a greater sense of awareness in terms of like, how time is spent, but just develop much better habits. So the first step is just having clarity and awareness. So don't worry, you don't have to share this with anyone. You can <laughs> you can do it just for yourself and on your own computer. There's no judgment here. Um, so this has also been very, very helpful. And then there's another technique uh, that I wanna share in terms of like prioritization and productivity. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the Pomodoro technique, so in the late 1980s, uh, Francisco Cirillo set out to find a better way to manage his time, and he, he ironically used a uh, tomato-shaped kitchen timer to break up projects that he was working on into 25-minute intervals followed by five-minute breaks and called these pomodoros. So um, pomodoro actually means tomato in, in Italian, uh, and this is a great way to like break up tasks, especially when you've got a really daunting like task right in front of you and you don't even know where to start. And sometimes the best way is to simply just start with one 25 minute block followed by a five minute break and it just gets you going. Um, and there's a lot of free apps for this, um, for your phone, um, even online. And there's even a book, uh, it's called The Pomodoro Technique, you can check out. But the general idea is pretty simple. I don't know that you need necessarily read a book to, uh, to learn about how to break up time into 25 minute chunks followed by five minute breaks. But it's a great way to build on productivity and actually start to build momentum. So you can start looking at your tasks like, okay, so that task is two Pomodoros. So meaning, let's say it's like an hour task um, so you break it up into two 25 minute chunks followed by, you know, after each 25 minute chunk, it's a five minute break. Um, and that's a great way to just break up really big tasks and get started and start being productive. So a couple other ways to protect time. Um, and these are the things that I've personally found helpful. And then when, when I reached out to many of our clients, things that they said they were very helpful. Uh, one is to never take unscheduled calls or meetings. Uh, now, I know that there might be some initial resistance to this, so there are emergencies at times. So you always wanna make sure that there's at least one way to get in touch with you, whether it's through your assistant or someone in your office that like someone can get a hold of um, if there is an emergency. But um, if you're constantly taking random calls and meetings and things like that, and you're going to lunches and all sorts of stuff, you'll find that your time really gets away from you. And those distractions make it um, very difficult to sometimes refocus your attention. The other one is to devote specific time blocks to uh, employee and team member questions or check-ins. So this is the common like got a minute kind of um, situation where you know team members are asking for help or they have a question. I have found that when I can set up kind of uh, an open office hour, whether it's at the end of the day, let's say it's like five or six or six to 7 p.m. or something like that, that um, is available and open to anyone who may have questions. In the past, let's say two years that I've been doing this, I have yet <laughs> to have somebody uh, ask a question during that time. And, and the reason being is that if that is the time you've set out um, to allow those types of questions, many times um, you're, you'll find that your team members solve those challenges and problems and stucks that they have on their own and uh, it never gets to you. So it's just important to devote specific time blocks um, so you are available, but it doesn't mean that you're always available because we're trying to protect your time. Um, and then sign out a chat, email, whatever's distracting you, put your phone on airplane mode if you have to. Um, definitely sign out of like any kind of social media. Uh, I've disabled like notifications on my phone, like pop-ups, um, you know, things like that that can just be consistent distractions to really allow you to focus on the task at hand. Um, but be flexible with your schedule, right? You know, there's going to be unforeseen things that happen probably every single day. So add in buffer time so you're not so tightly scheduled that you really just don't have time to take on anything new that might come up. So this can be a couple 30 minute blocks or an extra hour or something like that that allows you to, if something does arise, you say, okay, that, that's no problem. I've blocked out three to four o'clock today for or just buffer time, and if something doesn't happen, for example, then you can uh, you can fill that with one of your top items, and you know you can get out of the office an hour early. You know, so there's really no downside. All right, the second productivity hack is delegation, and you'll find that the, you know many of these concepts are pretty pretty known concepts, but um, we're we're adding a lot of meat to them. So it's not just you know one thing is say okay and you know, prioritize prioritize, but with like the level of prioritization that we've outlined, there's really a lot more to it. And the same thing applies to delegation. So with this one, you know, delegation is the key to maximizing productivity. And don't wait to do this until you're just slammed, right? And in fact, um, the mantra that we have is that if anyone else can do it, delegate it. 
right? You are the owner of your law firm, right? Like the chances are like the highest and best use of your time is probably not always being spent on the items which you're working on. And it's much better for you to focus on your strengths and where you can make the biggest impact than simply getting into the weeds and details of, of your business. So it's important to always maximize your productivity and focus on activities that are the highest and best use of your time. Like what really moves the needle forward? What makes your firm money? And there's a, uh, uh, there's a good example and case study of this. I think this is actually one of the most popular case studies in the Harvard Business Review. It came out in 1974 where they talk about like who's got the monkey. So I'm sure we've all run into this type of situation or scenario where you've got a team member that walks up to you and says, good morning, and by the way, we've got a problem, you know, and then they start kind of explaining this problem, and what you realize and recognize is this, this happens pretty commonly, right? Um, so they brought something to your attention that you know enough about to get involved, but not enough to make an on-the-spot decision. So what happens is, is that you're on your way, let's say, to either another meeting or a call to court, and so you say something along the lines of, thank you for, um, for letting me know, but I'm on my way to, to court or I'm on my way to a meeting. Let me think about it, I'll let you know, and then the two of you part ways. So now the question remains, like who's accountable for solving the problem, right? Uh, you or your team member. And in this type of situation, you've got this proverbial monkey, right? So this is the, the problem, the challenge, whatever it is, has leaped off your team member and onto your back. And what you really need to do here to avoid um, essentially becoming the firefighter of your law firm and ultimately like bearing all of the burden and everybody's problems um, is you need to find a way to either give it back to your subordinate and make sure that they keep it, right? So delegation really involves two things, right? It's one is holding your team members accountable for handling handling their own monkeys in terms of being solutions focused instead of just you know transferring those problems to you. And then also passing along your challenges and barriers to your subordinates so that you can refocus your efforts, right? You don't have to solve every single problem. Um, so. It's interesting, in this Harvard Business Review study, they kind of outline this uh, in, in several ways, right? They say, here's kind of the care and feeding of monkeys, which are really just these problems and tasks that can get offloaded from one of your team members onto you. So uh, one is that monkeys should be fed or shot, meaning that you either handle it, handle it or nix it, um, but you don't want to have too many open loops to where you've got like 200 things that you've got to handle that you just haven't gotten around to handling um, because at that point it just, you know, it sucks the energy out of you and these things just go into limbo. Um, the other thing is that um, in general, when addressing one of these things, it shouldn't take more than five to 15 minutes to handle it, right? And also, as far as addressing problems and challenges that your team members bring to you, um, this should be done by appointment only. Right, meaning that um, you should have set times to address these, to whether you have meetings with your intake team, with your marketing team, with, with your operations team, for example, um, where there's set times in the week um, that you guys discuss, discuss all these challenges and you can address them rather than having them all happening at variable times. And then another one, this is key, and this is something that we do in our own business, and I do this with my team members, is that when we're discussing a problem or challenge like this, this is done in like the solutions are resolved face-to-face or over the phone, right? Not through email. Now, it's not to say that like having documentation and, and going back and forth through emails can't like can't help, but at that point you've got an inbox that's slammed, and then you're you know you're having to follow up on emails and ask you know if, did you get a response to something. It's better if it's just addressed at set times, and this is the way that um, we made it a policy as far as bringing. Um, pain points or challenges to me so like we handle it face to face and that way my inbox does not get just slammed right um, and then with any t type of challenge or task like this um, at, you know after each meeting either there's a time that's sent um, like that's set to discuss the next steps so we never just part ways and say all right you know do this there should always be whatever the next action item is so to report back on uh, what was the outcome of that or if there's going to be a follow-up meeting when is that meeting and then the uh, degree of the initiative as far as the priority right so it's important that you communicate the priority of things to your team members because if everything is urgent then nothing is urgent right um, and then people become desensitized and numb to all the different initiatives that you've got going on in your business to where when you've got something that's truly important and should be prioritized they look at it as everything else and it's again everything has been urgent so um, it's important that you like define the degree of that initiative. Sometimes I'll say like, look, here's what we've got to do. But honestly, this thing is actually not that 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 important. It's it's probably a very low priority item. So let's just have it done within the next two weeks, for example, as opposed to this has got to get done today in the next hour. And then finally, as far as delegation, 
when is it time to hire, right? Because you can't get around this as far as expanding capacity. There's things that you can do as far as like, you know, uh, it, making your productivity uh, just much more effective and efficient in the productivity of your team. But consider running a firm um, that's lean or even a solo, uh, you know, a solo law firm. But like when it's at capacity, it could be like running a marathon without proper training and nutrition, right? So meaning that you may not finish the race, nor are you going to perform at the top of your game, but you can really get ahead by expanding not just your capabilities, um, but the capabilities of your team by hiring additional team members. So this really allows you, um, and expanding your team allows you not only to increase bandwidth and not just yours, but other team members, but taking on additional cases, increasing revenue, um, focusing your efforts on like just your strengths, right? So, so strategy, how do we really move things forward? And most importantly, increasing your capacity. But hiring sometimes, I think it's, uh, you know, it's it could be approached as, uh, as kind of a taboo topic in that, you know, how am I going to hire all these people? They're so expensive and all those things. But, you know, you really should look at hiring team members as investments to be maximized and not necessarily costs to be minimized, right? I get it. Payroll is a, is a, is a heavy expense for any business. But if you do it right, when you're hiring people and team members, those people allow you to expand your capacity so they're making an impact and adding value as opposed to simply just collecting paychecks. So when you look at things as a cost, and this can really be anything, right? Not just team members, but also various initiatives and things that you invest money in. Um, as a cost, you look at things that need to be minimized or avoided. You've got to control the ex expenditure of resources. There's a low likelihood of return with little value added, and there's a little perceived control over the outcome, right? Whereas an investment, this allows you when you invest in an amazing team member that frees up your time, that allows you to focus on things that really make you make you money and are the highest and best use of your time, that allows your firm to grow. In addition, um, when you can allow your, like, your team to be able to focus on more initiatives and where they're not spread too thinly to the point where nothing's really getting done. Um, that allows you to provide higher returns as well. And you've got a high degree of control from the standpoint that if someone's not adding value, and you've, let's say you've trained them, you've onboarded them, you've provided them with the support, and they're simply not adding value, I don't know of any business owner that you know that pays their you know 26 weeks of salary uh, or 26 payrolls, excuse me, um, all up front. You know, so we're not paying anyone's salary up front. So if someone's not being effective, um, either you meet with them and figure out what those stucks are, or ultimately you could free up their future and find somebody who can help add value to your business. So um, again, hiring is very much an investment, and if you look at it simply at like a cost, uh, it simply may mean that you either may have not found the right person for that role yet. Or uh, it's just time for a mindset check in that, you know, the it, hiring additional people, like we would not be where we are today without the phenomenal team members that we have. I mean, they're the reason why our growth rate has been what it is. Um, so I highly advocate approaching hiring as very much as an investment. Now, in terms of outsourcing, because this is one that's um, also quite common, right? I know that there's, you know, for those of us that read like the four hour work week and books like that, we're thinking, okay, well, what are the things that we can outsource? And it, so there's, Essentially, outsourcing is a great way where you can uh, not only make things more efficient, but reduce costs for certain initiatives. Typically, I find that commodities can be outsourced, but there's things that you don't want to outsource, right? So you want to make sure that there's a certain degree in, of quality and accuracy and consistency. Um, so there's things you want to keep in house. So for example, you can outsource things like data entry, bookkeeping and taxes, right? Graph design, direct mail, transcription, even research, but you don't ever want to outsource your business strategy, right? Your customer service, um, even things like you know, social media, right? Simply making social posts doesn't always move the needle forward. It's important that um, when you're doing things like social media, that that is your, your brand's voice, right? Um, and when you're highlighting things going on in your office, like that that's, um, that that's done um, not just for the sake of making the posts, but ultimately is aligned with culture of your firm. Um, also hiring and firing and company culture. These are things that you generally don't want to outsource because these require a very unique skill set, unique expertise. Um, and unfortunately, if you do outsource some of them, um, you can ultimately like you're not going to not only are you not going to be as effective, but um, as as a business, there's some things that you really want to keep in house to maintain quality, consistency, and accuracy. But when you are looking for the things to outsource, there's a couple great sites where you can find VAs like virtual assistants and freelancers. Um, Upwork is a great site. Fiverr, freelancer, virtual. I mean, there's so many of them out there. Um, it is really important that you provide complete clarity, like um step by step instructions because if you're outsourcing to someone that you're paying two dollars an hour um it may work fine for things like data entry but um that person probably shouldn't be doing your marketing strategy right um and then 
in terms of delegation, so you know, there's there's a couple of factors. You know, you can't simply just hand someone something and expect it to be done, right? I mean, if that was the case, then I'm sure we'd all be um, living in a utopia, if you will. But there's three factors that need to happen um, to ensure that the items that you delegate are completed, right? So one, you've got to provide full clarity over the task that needs to be done. I find that it's very helpful to put this in writing and also outline what are the success factors and like the success criteria, like what has to be true when this project or when this task is finished. Um, who's accountable uh, for ensuring it's done? It doesn't mean that that person is actually physically doing it. In fact, it may even be multiple people that are a part of a project or an initiative, but only one person is accountable, right? So you've got one point person um, that is accountable for this initiative and even co you know, coordinating other stakeholders in it. And then a deadline, when is it due? So when you appoint accountability and you set a deadline um, to your action items, this increases the chance of these goals being hit 95%, right? I mean, it's it's huge, right? So it's, instead of simply asking a team member to take care of something, um, give them the accountability and give them the ownership to, um, if there's external resources that they need, if there's a, you know, uh, a budget that they need, provide them with that and always provide a deadline because no deadline means that it could get done today, tomorrow, or a year from today. All right, productivity hack number three, systemization. Um, so we're down to our last two, uh, and let's talk about the need for systems. So like how many times have you completed a task that no one else in your office knew how to do? Um, or it, because it was faster to do it yourself. And this, this is a dangerous, um, this is a dangerous path to go down, right? Like if anything were to ever happen to you and you're the only one who knows how to do something within your office, like what happens to the rest of the team, right? What happens to your practice, right? If you're the only one who knows how to do the billing or you're the only one that knows how to do the bookkeeping um, or you're the only one that has the passwords and logins to something, this is a very dangerous road to be on. So it's important to have really great systems and processes. So when you've got great systems, like and uh, specifically, let's talk about processes first. So having a documented process in place, this ensures that like the steps are done consistently every single time. It's kind of like your in-flight checklist. Um, so when you're, you know, when you're boarding any plane, I mean, those pilots have hundreds, if not thousands, of flight hours. So they they know how to take off and land. But every single time they go down and they check off their in-flight checklist, and it's not just because they don't know how to do it, but it's so they make sure that it's done consistently every single time because they've got you know people on this plane. So why would it be any different in your business? I mean, McDonald's has processes, right? And like McDonald's has pro uh, processes for hourly workers. So why is it that business owners sometimes believe that they're hiring people and they don't need processes and they don't need systems, right? Um, so it's very important to have documented process for anything that's happening on a recurring basis. So as we talk about kind of the interplay between systems and processes, systems support the processes which support people. And you've got to have all three in place. Um, now, sometimes these require maintenance, but um, to give you an idea as to like what should you automate, what should you delegate, what should you do yourself, um, first consider like with every single task that you're doing on a repeating basis, step one, uh, is it something that can be automated to a system? So like email drip campaigns, for example, or e-sign. Um, the other question is, or can I, you know, if it's something that's a manual process, can I delegate this to a person? And then finally, which this should be the rarest of all three, um, do I do it myself, right? So there's something that you may want to do yourself, but you still should have your own processes documented and kind of a system in place to where if you're out of the office, if you're sick, if you're on vacation, that there's a way in which those activities get done. But I find if you stick in the first two as firms of like, can it be automated to a system? Or if it's a manual process, um, can I delegate this to a person? Those are the two that you can really help to get things off of your plate. So. Uh, to give you an idea, when you see breakdowns in processes and systems, um, if you're completing a task manually, like every single time, um, I mean, just as an example, if you're, uh, if you, instead of having an email drip campaign that you use to follow up with your clients, you are writing every single email or someone on your team is writing every single email to follow up with people, that's something that can be automated and that can free up that person's time. Or if you've got, let's say, a system, but the way in which something's being done is different every single time or it's different across every single person, um, then you really need to make sure that you examine your process to make sure that things are done consistently, right? So for example, if you walk into any Starbucks on the planet, right? Um, and you order any kind, any type of cup of coffee, it tastes the same, whether it's in Tokyo, whether it's in California, whether it's in Dallas, um, and that's because they've got a very clear, consistent process and system in place. So when you got system breakdown, for example, um, you may be using like spreadsheets or notepads or post-it notes, right, to um, handle intake and onboard clients. 
and you can improve that system by switching to like a cloud-based case management system, for example. Or let's say you do have a system, but um, but there's no organizational method established for actually utilizing it. That's where you can improve your processes. So there's several opportunities where um, if you're presently relying on like manual processes or kind of a manual way of doing things, that uh, we saw this happen actually. You know, a year ago when they had the uh, um, like the the floods in in Texas, where like uh, farms that were using just um, print documents and like the print records, and everything got flooded and everything was gone. I mean, that was traumatic to their business. Um, so really think about how you're doing things like client intake, case management, document file management, and even marketing and client relations. So uh, consider leveraging external platforms that you can use to automate, systematize, and organize those processes. Um, here's a few examples. Uh, these are just a few popular platforms like Captura um, does a phenomenal job for like client intake. Um, Filevine does case management. Dropbox is great for file management as well. QuickBooks, which also has QuickBooks Online, great for bookkeeping. Constant Contact and MailChimp are great for email marketing, and you can even create uh, drip campaigns in those. So there's a lot of platforms available. You just have to you know, ultimately evaluate and decide which works best for your needs and your firm. But the benefits of systemization are really in the fact that um, not only does this improve the quality of your client's experience, but it makes sure that your clients have a consistent client experience. So every single day, um, the clients, the calls are handled in a very similar way that it doesn't matter if um, somebody calls on a Tuesday or a Thursday or a 2 p.m. or 5 p.m., that that client has the same experience. It makes you more referable, makes the practice more scalable, it keeps things from slipping through the cracks, um, holds the team accountable, and then even when you've got these processes documented, it makes it easier to train new people. So for example, we have somebody new start the company in a certain role, We've got all the processes outlined for that role, and we can simply hand them a binder um, that basically says, here are all the processes for this role as we're training them and as we're onboarding them, and that makes it very easy to make sure that they're onboarded in a very consistent way. But most importantly, it frees up your time by letting others handle the things that are not the highest and best use of your time. So the best way to get started with systems and processes is first and foremost, identify the aspects of your law firm that need to have processes, uh, and then identify a team member to write the process, right? It doesn't have to be you. In fact, it's probably better uh, to have the person who actually does that activity. Um, so, in, in, for example, in our team, we have each of our team members that's over a certain initiative. They write the process for their own initiatives. Um, you both agree on the ideal outcome of the process in terms of like the level of detail, and it may even be helpful, you know, not to go inception on you guys, but to have a process for how to document a process to make sure that they're all documented consistently. Um, assign that to your team member, and then uh, make sure that all these processes are compiled in one location and they're organized in a way. So here's a couple tools that we've used, um, whether it's Sweet Process, Reich, or Process Street. Um, Sweet Process and Process Street are actually really great for outlining processes in detail and they're a good repository for them. Reich is a platform you can actually put things in step by step, so uh, feel free to check any of these out and they may be helpful to you. All right, so the next one is um, how do you standardize your meetings? Because this is a huge time suck. There's so many law firms. Uh, the average average company, according to the Harvard Business Review, is spending 15% of their time in meetings, and most people find meetings fairly unproductive in that time is being spent, but there's not always that output. In fact, you have to consider how much are your meetings costing you, right? So consider how many people you've got in that meeting, the hourly rate of every meeting participant, and the length of time that that meeting is being held, and you may find that you're having $10,000 meetings, right, about things that are, you know, let's say $500 initiatives, right? So that is probably not the highest and best use of everybody in that room. And our rule is that if somebody is not actually contributing to the meeting and if they're not uh, you know, somewhat accountable for an initiative that's a component of what we're discussing, they're not in the meeting, right? Um, respect your team members, free up their time. Um, so there's a couple things that you can do to standardize your meetings. Number one, send out an agenda beforehand and you can even have team members do this when they're asking for meetings with you. No agenda, no meeting. Um, keep the meeting short to 30 minutes. Um, set a timer. Like we, we always have like a timekeeper when we have multiple items to discuss that we allocate time just to make sure that we don't spend more, you know, all the time talking about one item. Uh, assign one note taker for each meeting. This is typically the person who's accountable for making sure that what's discussed in the meeting gets done. And then um, with action items, always be sure to outline who's accountable, what the initiative is, and what the deadline is. Um, and then you can have very productive meetings. So finally, this brings us to productivity hack number four, automation. Um, and I, you know, I would ask you, have you ever wondered how much time you waste uh, every single week on tasks that could be entirely automated? So uh, you can automate tasks that are recurring. 
uh, using your systems and processes to where it doesn't require like a manual process. Um, and then you can delegate initiatives to those people who are accountable for executing them. So as we discussed earlier, with every task that you have going on in your business, ask yourself, um, is this something that can be automated? In which case you can automate it to a system, like you know, like an email drip campaign. Um, there's certain aspects of case intake and um, and even on the operation side, onboarding clients, things like that. Um, or if it's a manual process, can you delegate this to another person, right? So not you. And then finally, worst case scenario, and I hope you, this happens 1% of the time, do I do it myself? It's probably not you, right? It's probably one of the first two. Um, and there's several automation tools that you can use. Uh, these are just a few examples. Like uh, Acuity Scheduling allows, uh, and we use this, uh, allows clients and prospects to self-book appointments. It even sends them reminders, emails and text reminders, and syncs to their calendar. So this is great for scheduling. Um, Zapier is a, uh, is a platform that literally connects to just about anything. So if you want to have two applications work together, like let's say you want to sync contact forms to your CRM to create a new contact record every time someone submits a form, you can do this with Zapier, where you can connect two different applications. And then Drift's a form of live chat that lets you bring um, chatbots to your website. So um, here's a couple different automation tools that you can use for your firm. Um, there's email marketing software, so you can automate email marketing, like I said, for autoresponders, Drift campaigns. When someone submits a contact form, we find that it's really helpful to send them an autoresponder confirming that uh, you've received their form and you're going to be contacting them, let's say, within, um, you know, 12 hours or 24 hours or whatever it might be. Um, and there's a few options for that, like Constant Contact and MailChimp. Um, then there's various case management platforms um, that help to organize and automate many, much of what's happening in terms of case management across your firm and ensuring that nothing slips through the cracks. And then e-signature. Um, this helps kind of take the hassle out of faxing and scanning and print print records and all that kind of stuff to make sure that you can do these through e-signatures. So like HelloSign, DocuSign, even Captor does this. Um, so these are just a few different tools that you can use to automate things across your practice. And here's an example of this, right? So imagine you've got somebody visits your website, fills out a contact form. When you've got things automated, this new contact record is automatically created in your CRM. Um, you receive an, an automatic notification that person who submitted the form, they also receive a personalized autoresponder. Uh, you've got a team member on your intake team, for example, that receives a notification to follow up. They call and they screen this potential client. They send them an, a, uh, an e-sign agreement through the e-sign platform. They sign the agreement, automatically sent back to you, and you've got a new case automatically open. You didn't have to do anything, right? It's amazing. This is automation, and you can do this across many areas of your practice. So as I mentioned, a couple things are like, you know, you can automate email. So different drip campaigns, depending on kind of where they are in their life cycle stage. So if, for example, if they just called you, you can you know, start sending them educational content. If they've just become a new client, you can share with them kind of how you typically work with clients. Or if, you know, it's before they become a client, um, just things that they, they need to know in terms of hiring, you know, whether it's your criminal defense attorney, personal injury, immigration, and so on. Um, that can also help to engage them. Uh, you can schedule monthly email newsletters that go out to your list and even autoresponders to contact forms. So... I'm sure by this point you're wondering, and we've talked about a lot, uh, this is great, Mike, but I don't have time for any of this, right? I'm already busy as it is. Uh, I don't have time to put all this automation in place and all these systems and processes. I mean, it's great that you're saying that, and I don't disagree, but where do you find the time? And this is where we get to the mindset check, right? And what this means is that here's the reality, right? When you invest in these strategies, you actually gain more control over how you spend your time. And what you do with that additional time, it's up to you. You can spend it with your friends and family. Um, you can travel. Uh, you can identify new ways to grow your law firm. You can actually use the time that you now have kind of bought back to invest more into like things that are the highest and best use of your time. Um, so the reality is that now is typically never a good time for anyone, right? But consider, and when you do the kind of the, um, that activity inventory, like what is the cost if I don't do these things, right? So if you continue to put this stuff off, um, things will never get better, right? No one is coming to save anyone, right? The reality is if you take this stuff seriously, you you know, it doesn't mean you have to do it all at once, but one thing at a time. So to, to, to bring this all together, right? Um, the law firms that are able to expand their capacity and maximize their productivity are the ones that can prioritize effectively. So you're leveraging things like time blocking, the top three, you know, so that you're only focusing on the things that are the highest and best use of your time. This is Pareto principle um, that you can delegate effectively. So if anybody else can do it, they should do it, not you, right? So, and then when you're delegating, you're delegating in a way that doesn't create a ton of open files, meaning that you're always identifying who's accountable, what the success criteria are for whatever you're delegating and when it's due. And then uh, systematizing, so really creating processes around anything that's done on a recurring basis. So if it happens more than twice, 
typically needs a process. And then you can even leverage various types of systems to streamline things across your law firm from client intake to case management to document management, all sorts of different things. And then finally, um, anything that, for example, doesn't need a manual process and can be automated that you can automate. Um, so you can find various platforms for automating emails, internal communications, client documentation, and onboarding. So these are, again, these are just some of the things that you can do. Um, if you're interested in the slide deck, I'll provide my email in just a moment, and as well as that guide. But I do want to mention something first. And for those of you that have not already heard, uh, if you, and if you're interested in learning more ways to take your practice to the next level, so things that we will not share on any webinar, right? So this is kind of like the internal stuff um, that are like the, the highest, probably the fastest growing law firms in the country are doing, and that um, we're hosting a crisp conference. So this is the Game Changer Summit. It'll be taking place in Atlanta, November 9th and 10th. Um, and we've announced two of our speakers will be announcing 10 more, right? One is former FBI lead hostage negotiator. The other one's a Navy SEAL. Um, we have an incredible, incredible lineup of speakers. And this is going to be something that's for probably the most um, engaged like attorneys that are really looking to take their business to the next level. No fluff, no nonsense. Like this, the, the goal of this um, is ultimately to provide over $100,000 worth of impact in just the first day alone. So our early bird ticket sales are actually about to end. Um, if you visit crispsummit.com, you can use promo code webinar and you'll save a hundred bucks off any of the tickets. Um, and this is one that we're going to do right. It's been a long time coming. We're very excited to do it. And uh, I can assure you that you will not be disappointed. And I wish I could share with you who all the speakers are, but we're going to be kind of spreading them out month by month. And then finally, as promised, I promise I wouldn't hold out on you guys. But if you like that lawyer's seven-step guide to maximum productivity, uh, you can get that free blueprint at crispvideo.com forward slash productive. And then if you have any questions at all, um, I love this stuff and I'm more than happy to help. So feel free to email me and my team um, and we'd be more than happy to help. Thanks again, guys.